Perna, what's his background since he's written so much? And maybe Rico, you could share a little bit of your background. Some people want to know about you and if you're a historian or what's, you know, he's muted. Yeah, you are muted, Rico. He needs to be unmuted. He needs permission from he the He needs host. permission to unmute. You don't have permission yet and I can't give you permission. Uh, are you sure? They're figuring. They're figuring it out. Okay, I think I'm up now. Okay. All right, um, I'm a little bit of everything. Uh, historian, just one of the titles that I carry, but uh, my proudest title is Virgin Islander. Uh, my family ancestry on both my mother and my father's side of the family goes back to the early 1800s, uh, 1810, 185 uh, timeframe. Um, and everything about Virgin Islands history just just excites me and just you know tickles my senses. Um, as far as the uh, coal strike is concerned, uh, my great great grandfather uh, Felmin Canero was the bank president at the time of the coal strike. So I'm very much uh, knowledgeable about things that uh, were happening at that time frame. And then with the second coal strike in 1916. Uh, my great-grandfather uh, was uh, one of the colonial council members and also a bank president at the time. Uh, so he, uh, along with uh, Mr. George Moorhead, who was the union president for the, uh, the, the coal workers at that time, along with Mr. Ding Sixto, uh, you know, were very closely uh, working together, along with all the other names that you mentioned, Jarvis and stuff like that. So first and foremost, Kaziah did exist. Um, you know, you go back, you see, you won't find the name Butto in any of the census records either, but I doubt very seriously if anyone would contest the fact that, that he did exist. Uh, make a long story short, any questions that we're not able to answer right now, please do go ahead and post your questions on the uh, Facebook site because we will follow through and answer those for you off the air uh, because it is an important thing to, to, to answer those questions for you as well as to make ourselves as resources for anything that you may think about down the road. So whether it's this call, another call, or just hit me up wherever you can, uh, I'm more than happy to be a resource in any way, shape or form that I can for anyone who wanted to learn about family history, want to learn about Virgin Islands history or any of these specific events that are so important to us uh, throughout our island's history. Like Myron Jackson mentioned, if you want to talk about 1733, we can talk about that. That was uh, the St. John's Liverpool. If you want to talk about 1848, with uh, General Butto, we can talk about that. If we want to talk about 17, I'm sorry, 1878 with Queen Mary, we can do that. And, and same way, uh, Nadine, uh, Ruby Simmons, uh, uh, Mr. Sproul, all of us have that same passion in our heart to share this information with everyone. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're all very approachable and more than happy to share this information with you. In addition to that, if you find something, please send it to me because I want to see it. There is, there is, you know, people run into information and they think, oh, Nadine must already know this. Don't assume that. Please, I always like to see new research in old documents. And so if you find something that I may not know it, please send it off. You know, Nadine, we might say to people, because we've got quite a few people on the line here, that over the course of the next year, before we have our next dollar for dollar tour, we'll challenge people to see what they can find about Queen Kaziah and about the Ooh. coal workers to share Ooh. our next, next year's event. Awesome. Yes. Challenge raised. Challenge, challenge accepted. <laughs> so we'd like to thank you for, the, for listening to us. And we're going to hand it back to um, the people who put this all together, and many thanks to you for allowing us to present to you. Okay, wow, what an amazing presentation, Nadine amazing. and Ruby. Yes. We wanted to get in just a couple more questions we saw in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave now because I have to take care of something else right at this moment. But thank you for involving me, and if there are any questions that come up that you know, you can always shoot them to me by text and I'll try to respond. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Ruby. Okay, bye-bye. Um, there was one about the Mexican coin. General Santana was yes. the one that caused the introduction of the Mexican coin. 
the tally? Was this the cause of the coal carriers' rebellion? And what was the value of it? I can help answer that question if I'm unmuted. Yes, you yes, are. You are. I'm there. unmuted. Okay. So uh, General Santana, and just to set the stage, he was the one that fought at the Alamo in Texas and they ended up killing Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone, all those good stuff. Then he came a little bit further to San Jacinto. He ended up losing that particular battle. And after long losing at that battle, he said, please don't kill me. Matter of fact, I'll give you half of the country of Mexico if you spare my life. So they spared his life, ended up giving up half the uh, country of Mexico. And they said, okay, well, we're not really happy that you gave up half of our country. You're gonna be exiled. So General Santana said, well, fine, I'll go exile, I'll leave but I'm taking about $3 million worth of Mexican silver with me. So when he left Mexico, one of the places that he settled was in St. Thomas. And this is in the 1860s. And he brought his approximately $2 million worth of Mexican silver. Uh, Ruby Simmons mentioned earlier that the, in, unlike the United States that prints like a penny, a dime, a nickel for every single year, in the Danish West Indies, we're a small colony of uh, Denmark. So coins were only printed probably once every 10 years or 15 years or, or as needed. So what happened was the Mexican silver kind of became the pseudo currency just because there was a lot of it available. Now, when the value of silver started to go down, there was nothing really backing it. And because of that, you had coal workers that were still earning that one penny for the last 30 years or however long, but that penny one day was now worth 90%. And then it was worth 80% and then 70% and 60%. And it got to a point where for every dollar that they had worked for, they were only getting about 60% of the value. And in some cases, about 50% of the value. And in Tortola, there was reports of it being as low as 30% of the value. So you put in a full day's work, you weren't getting your, your, your money back out of it. And for lack of a better term, the merchants didn't want to absorb that loss. So they were kind of passing it on to anybody that shopped at their stores, or in particular, the ones that took the full brunt were the coal workers. So imagine this, you go to the store, you buy something for a dollar, they give you change, they would give you their tokens. But if you're a coal worker, that's your paycheck. The whole thing was this currency that wasn't worth a whole lot. And uh, when I was speaking with uh, uh, Dr. Simmons uh, the other day, it was kind of like you getting a gift card to Walmart, but in the Virgin Islands, they only have Kmarts. So yes, there's some value to it, but it doesn't do you any good right now when you're trying to put food on the table for your family. And right, because the, the token could have been for a bar exactly. or a rum shop, right? Exactly. And you so, need bread. Yeah. And, and in 1892, what was happening was the tally program would work. Every time you went back and forth, they give you one tally. And then at the end of the day, then they would tally up how many trips that you made. And from that, you would get paid in the Mexican silver. Um, uh, Bronsted uh, Company was the main coaling company back in the 1890s. So a lot of the tokens that survived were not necessarily the coal workers tokens because the company took those back at the end of the day and exchanged it for the silver. The ones that survived were the merchant tokens, the ones that everyday people would get that, okay, I bought something, I got some change, what am I gonna do with this? It's no value to me, I'll just throw it in a drawer. And kind of like how when we go on vacation outside the United States, we come back with foreign currency. We have those coins left back that are worth something, but we can't really spend it. That's why many more of those coins survived versus the merchant tokens because the merchants kept theirs. And the, the uh, King of Denmark outlawed the token program in the 1890s. And then in 1920, the most current coal token that you see, it was a re- vitalization of the program. And those are the ones that you see today, the 1920 total co coal tokens, and those were involved with the second strike that took place around 1916. Thank you for giving us that answer, Mr. Canero.